The beautiful Jean de Mar in Paris, lying in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. Many of us can happily envision ourselves there, but it takes an especially creative mind to not only imagine a horse and a dog unnoticeably living in this famous spot, but having conversations about the wonders of the world. And I kept thinking, oh, this is such a ridiculous idea, but I couldn't give it up. I, I would come back to it while I was working on other things. More than anything, the idea made Pulitzer Prize winning author Jane Smiley happy. And she felt many of us could use a cheery escape right about now. And so Perestroika in Paris came to be, with smile-inducing animal conversations among Perestroika the horse and Frida the dog, as well as a raven, two mallards, and a couple of rats who seem to have intuitive powers in their whiskers. For example, here's a section of the book where Kurt the rat is talking about the 96-year-old woman whose house he lives in. The broadcast that he got from her through his whiskers was, he thought, the most interesting thing about her. She gave off almost no signal. According to his rat instincts, she was hardly alive, maybe not alive, and yet she was very active for a dead being. And she was especially expert and adept at grooming, something that rats paid considerable attention to. Humans in the book don't hear the animals talking, and that helps to keep the story believable and relatable. After all, if there's anyone who understands the relationship between humans and animals, particularly horses, it's Jane Smiley. Her love for all things equine started while growing up in St. Louis. She even had special access to a school pony while attending community school. The sixth grade girls were the ones who took care of the pony. We were on the pony committee. Today, she has three of her own horses, and several of her books have been about the beautiful animals. Her writing is fueled by Diet Coke and a love of literature cultivated at John Burroughs School in St. Louis, where she graduated high school. We read lots and lots of great books, and I actually did make it through algebra. <laughs> We chat with her about her childhood days, the real life horse and dog who are the namesakes and inspiration for the characters in her latest title, and the loads of research she did to become a horse, dog, raven, mallard, and rat. Oh, you betcha. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> it was fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I wish you were here in your old stomping grounds with us. That would be fun. I really do too. So, so you grew up in what Webster Groves in Ladue, is that right? Yes, I grew up in Webster uh, from about the age of one until, how old was I? 11. Um, and then we moved to Crevecore for a year and then we moved to Ladue. I, I so remember just walking around and looking at things and enjoying myself. And I just loved it there. I was, I mean, you got, you got to spend such formative years of your life in, in St. Louis. Was there something that you remember or cherish, you know, a cherished memory that you hold on to most? Well, there's so many, you know, the, the one of the great ones is my uh, uncle who lived in Chicago coming and taking us down to Deer Creek and showing us the fossils. But I also have a funny memory of my cousin who still lives in St. Louis, I won't say his name, but taking me. So there was a commuter railway that ran along the bottom of our street. And he took me up to the railroad tracks and he told me that I had, if I didn't want to get sucked under the train, I had to stand two feet from the train, otherwise it would suck me under. <laughs> Scared the pants off me. But there was so, we had so much fun, you know, and we got to run around and play and go to various neighborhoods and um, I just loved it. And, and this is where your love of horses really began because it started as a child for you, right? Yes. Um, 
my mother worked for the St. Louis Globe Democrat. She was the women's page editor. And my grandparents lived in Webster uh, near Avery School. And so I would stay with my grandparents during the day. And then my mother would uh, pick me up after her day at the office was done and take me over home. And she lived in an apartment in Brantwood. Anyway, for, for whatever reason, there was a, um, a pony ride on the corner of Manchester and Brentwood Boulevard. And I would get her to take, drop me there or take me there fairly often. That's how I remember it, but I was only five. <laughs> and um, they would send you around this little maze a few times. And, and of course, since you were strapped into the saddle, it was fun and um, safe. And it was always at a trot that you would go around the maze. So you got to go sort of fast, but not really fast. So it wasn't scary. And it just won me over. I thought, wow, this is what I'd love to do. And I really wanted to do it for the rest of my life. So um, that's probably what got me started. I read that you you loved horse books. <laughs> and there was one in particular that that was about a, a horse and a that that came to a girl. What was the name of that book? <laughs> that was one called Silver Birch, and it was set in Wisconsin. The girl lived on the family farm at the edge of the woods. She wanted a horse, as I did, and there was a horse running free in the woods. Now, why this? Why in the world this could happen in Wisconsin? I have no idea. But so she went out and she tamed the horse and she won it over and she brought it home and she got to keep it. And I thought, well, that's a great way to get a horse. And I kept looking around, you know, in Brentwood and Webster, where's that horse? Where's that <laughs> horse that I'm gonna tame and keep in the house? <laughs> that love of horses has continued to this day. You, you, you have what, three that you ride five, fairly three. regularly, right? Uh, about five days a week, yeah. And one of those horses names we will recognize, <laughs> right? Yes, Miss Perestroika, otherwise known as Paris. She is a 15-year-old mare. I bred her. She has had a very interesting life. I donated her. I had so many horses. I'm not even going to say how many. It's a night. It's terrifying to say how many. <laughs> and so I donated a couple of the mares that I had who were in, in full. I donated them to UC Davis, where the vet school is. The, the equine vet school. And it was a good thing I did because when she was born, the birth sac broke away from the mother's uterus. And so she was born weighing only about 75 pounds. Which and for that, a horse, that's, that's... that's very little. It might've even been less. I mean, it might've been more like 60. I can't even remember how, what it was. But because she was at Davis, they saved the mom and they saved her. I eventually took her back when she was about a year old, I think. And, and she was so much fun. She was so interesting. She loved to run. She loved to jump in the air. She loved, but she was friendly and sweet. And um, so now I've had her for, you know, let's say 15 years. And she's, she's peculiar, but she's really fun and she's very curious. And so that's what gave me the idea. I was in Paris, France in 2009. I was on the west side of the Seine eating at the Square du Trocadero. And I just visited a woman that I met through the New York Times named Gina Rarick, who is an American woman with a racing stable in France. And I had met her and visited her stable and I was fascinated by that. And so we were sitting in the Square du Trocadero eating onion soup, of course. Right. Um, and I looked around and I thought, you know, what would be really fun would be if a horse escaped from the racing stable and came into Paris. And of course, because Paris was a four-year-old, I thought of her. And I kept thinking, oh, this is such a ridiculous idea, but I couldn't give it up. I, I would come back to it while I was working on other things and I would have to go back to Paris and wander around and look at, look at the environment, which I always love to do. 
I love taking walks. That's one of the things I, I did in St. Louis. It's one of the things I have done ever since. So anyway, it just sort of built itself up and it, I found it very amusing and my husband found it very amusing. So we just kept at it. And, and so, you know, this is 11 years later and it, it seems <laughs> like the perfect time to publish such a sweet, you know, something that you can escape to because it is a book unlike one I've, I've read, I think. It was such an escape to be in the minds of animals and thinking about things that I have never even thought about, for example, the dog in the book. I mean, he, what happens to a dog of someone who's homeless after that homeless person passes? Well, the dog was based on our dog, who was a German short hair that we got, that you could sort of call her a rescue. I brought her home and, and um, I had to sort of worm her into the household because my husband wasn't really ready for another dog. We already had a Jack Russell and that's plenty of dog, you know? <laughs> But she just wormed her way into our affections because she was so sweet and so kind. And um, she loved to go to the beach. And so I, I had to put her in. If Paris was going to be in there, then I had to put Frida in too. I've read somewhere that you always have enjoyed a challenge, that when you started writing, you wanted to write some a book of every genre, that you wanted to do mm -hmm. a romance, comedy, an epic, a tragedy. Well, now you're into an animal talking book. Basically. I never expected to write fantasy. I never thought fantasy was up my alley. You know, the closest I came to fantasy was probably the Greenlanders because I had to imagine what, how people might be thinking in the middle ages. Um, and I enjoyed that a whole lot, but I still had to make it reasonably realistic. So I never expected to be doing a talking animal book, but I don't know if you have animals all the time and they're always around you, especially if you're on the back of a horse or you spend time with horses, you, you try to figure out what they're thinking. You try to figure out how they're thinking and how they're perceiving and all that. And so it seems natural that eventually you, you, you're going to give them a voice. I, I will tell this, tell this story. A few days ago, um, I was at the barn and I was, I had Paris on a lead rope. I was kind of walking her around and a friend of mine showed up and I said, Oh, I want to give you a copy of the book. And oh, she said, great. But the cars, I had one in my car, but the cars were parked very close together. So I handed her Paris's lead rope. And I went to my car and opened the door and brought out the book. And then I turned around and I showed my friend the book. Well, here comes Paris. It's kind of zipping over with her eyes wide open as if to say, hey, there I am. You know, I have no idea why she did that. But it was so funny. We just laughed and laughed. It was like she was saying, oh, finally, I'm famous. I'm, I'm getting what I deserve. <laughs> so you find yourself like talking for the horses anyway with what you think that they're saying. So it seems natural, so to speak, I suppose. But I, I, you know, I read somewhere that with your books, you always try to, you know, make things as believable as possible. And, and, and that had to have been a problem with this because or a challenge for you with this, because I mean, you're setting these animals in the most popular place of Paris in the shadows of the Eiffel Tower, and they're not noticed. Well, that was the big challenge, but I figured, okay, it's winter. It's not going to be as, there aren't going to be as many people around in the dark. And the Eiffel Tower, now this was in 2008, so things are slightly different now, but the Eiffel Tower is lit up, but the Champ de Mar is not lit up. And there are plenty of trees and it's a very large space. So I figured, okay, I will do my best to make this plausible. That's, that's what you have to do. You have to make it plausible and then you have to make the story a lot of fun so that plausibility is all that the reader needs. And then the fun of the, of the story kind of keeps it going. It, it, it is fun. That's exactly how I would describe it. And I, I read somewhere that your Hollywood agent said, oh, don't, this book, well, you'll never be able to sell it for a movies because there's not a villain. But 
in a way, I was always worried about, there's not a villain, but I was always worried about some things happening, right? Well, life is the villain. You know, every single animal and person is in some kind of chancy situation. You know, um, the old woman is evidently, according to the rat, near death. The boy is only eight years old. Paris is on the loose. Um, Frida is on the loose. So at least for them, you know, life is the big challenge. Right. And then some of the other characters, they have, they're, they're fine, but they aren't, they aren't living the, uh, the lives that they want to be living. And so th- I think that's the way it is for most people. Not everybody has some bad guy or some villain in their lives. And so I wanted it to be about, you know, what life is like or what, what life would be like if the situation continues to be plausible. So, so we see, we, you know, you obviously were in the head of the horse, you, you know, cause you're thinking about what the horse might be thinking when you're riding. And then Frida was so close to you. I mean, she, she passed a few years ago, right? She's no longer. Yeah. Ready. About two years ago now. So you were close with Frida, you're close with the horse, but as far as mallards and ravens and rats go, I mean, how did you get into the heads? Because all these animals are talking and they are hilarious. The raven and the rats in particular. Well, the, I, I looked them up, you know, I looked up what would be the natural characteristics of ravens and what do we know about rats? And it was quite interesting. Um, they all were more complex than I had realized. And, but I could make analogies, you know, between uh, let's say raven society and human society and mallards. Mallards turned out to be quite interesting. It, quite, it amused me to name one of them Sid and the other one Nancy. <laughs> Naming names do come up in the book where Paris doesn't understand why humans can't see the the differences between horses. So they have to name them, which I thought was so funny. (laughs) And then who's responsible for naming, right? Because, you know, that was a discussion. These animals have such interesting, you know, they're discussing, well, where do these names come from and who names who? Well, Raul names himself because he's, he's, he's a nobleman and he names himself. I think it's Raul Corvus Corax, the 23rd of, of that name. You know, he sees himself as avian royalty and he's quite disdainful of Sid and Nancy because they're, they're mallards, they're very common. But you know, Raul gets a lesson too, but I'm not gonna say what it is. Raul, he is spouting <laughs> factoids throughout the book, just like like a dad or something. <laughs> he's such well, a- you know, he's. He's, he's old. Right. And he's been around. He would say he's been around more than maybe we would say he's been around, but he, he likes to talk (laughs) and, you know, Frida wants to find a friend, but it could be that Raul also wants to find a friend. He doesn't admit that, but um, he takes to this group of animals and he's also curious. He doesn't mind, you know, flying up on windowsills and pecking at the windows and looking in and stuff like that. One of the things that he says is he was he was talking about all the languages that birds know. And you may not know this, but all birds speak Chinese. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did. <laughs> and the rats. So I do not like mice or rats at all. I don't even like to think about them. And yet in this book, I was excited when they came into the scenes because they are so funny. <laughs> well, it's a very old house that, um, that Etienne and his great grandmother live in. And so there have to be rats. I mean, they, these people are, are not c- c- capable of the maintenance that the house requires. She's too old and he's too young. And so obviously there are going to be rats that um, take advantage of the options in the house. Right. So I was thinking about them and I I just said, yeah, come on, there can be a rat. 
You're talking about in, in the book, an, an eight-year-old orphan shows up in the book mm -hmm. and he lives with his great grandma. And it's, it's, it, it brings in such sweetness in the book and um, it, it just such a fun story, a, a part of it. But back to the rats, I mean, you know, what are the lines? <laughs> <laughs> They're just so funny. Like, Kurt, well, you say, as a rat, Kurt could count to six. Conrad maintained that cats could only count to five. <laughs> So they have a lot of, the two rats have a lot of opinions about cats and they about do. how dangerous they are and how and about why in the world humans would ever become um, allies with cats and I have had cats I like cats but there has to be an enemy so I suppose I suppose the bad guy the bad guy is some cat somewhere right so I'm curious as you're as you're going through and getting ready for this book I mean you, you did some research on these animals as you said mm -hmm. but then do you think of these funny things you know as you're walking or and jot them down or do they just come to you as you're writing or how does that all work oh both you know sometimes they just come while you're writing and you make it the first person you want to make laugh is you you know, and I learned that when I wrote Moo, which was about a land grant university. And I just, I so enjoyed writing it because I just laughed all the time. And I would write a section and I'd think, wow, this is funny. And I'd laugh and I'd go read it to members of my family and they'd go, huh. <laughs> so, but I didn't care because I was making myself laugh. And that's the first person you want to entertain when you're writing, especially something comic. And then you just keep on going and one, one idea leads to another. And then you try to figure out how to put the puzzle together so that it actually is plausible and makes a little bit of sense or enough sense, let's put it that way. So do you, ha so do you have an outline before you start? Sometimes I have in the past, I didn't for this because I didn't, I had no idea. That's why I went to Paris so often, looked around because it was the place, it was the particular venues that would give me an idea. So I would walk down the Avenue de Suffren and I see a bakery there and I look in the window and that gave me the idea. Or I went over to where the vegetable markets were and I looked around and I saw that. So, so for, for a lot of books, it's the place itself that gives you the ideas. Yeah. It was true of A Thousand Acres. It was true of the Greenlanders. You know, it was, it's often true. I, I've heard authors say that, that sometimes they can hear their characters talking to them. Uh, do, you, do you feel that way with your characters? It really varies from book to book. So when I was writing the last hundred years trilogy, which was quite long, uh, and so it started in 1920 and it ended in 2019. And I got a ways into it. I can't remember exactly how far. And then I began to feel like I knew the characters so well that I was sitting with them on a, in a train car or something and just listening to them. Right. And writing down what they had to say. And that was fascinating to me because I, uh, I hadn't really had that experience before. I had had the experience where I felt I knew the characters well enough to write about them, but I hadn't really had that experience where they seemed to, I don't know, just go their own way and tell <laughs> and, and take me along. And I liked it. It was a fun experience. What's next? Do you know? Uh, there's a couple of, there's a couple of books in the stew pot, but I'm not going to say what they are. <laughs> we'll just have to stay tuned and, and see what comes out next yes well let me tell you I, I thoroughly enjoyed this book and um and so and I'm so thankful to you for giving me a little bit of escape from this sometimes crazy world that we're in yeah well that's it worked for me thank you so much for joining us to chat with us about this thank you very much she said after lunch, I will come up with a plan. Lunch? It's when humans come here to eat. But the cafes are all shut up today, so they're going to eat inside. That's good for us. Paris was sleepy indeed. She blew the air out of her nostrils and let her eyelids drift closed. 
Pretty soon, she was making a snuffling noise with her lips. <laughs>